I remember very clearly uh, the first time I was ever exposed to pornography. I think I was about 12 years old at the time. I remember the house I was at. It was a good friend of mine growing up. We were at his house having a sleepover party, uh, sleepover with a few other guys. And the guy's house, who it was, he looked at us as it started getting late at night, and he said, hey, um, I found a stash of magazines that my dad has. Who wants to run downstairs and, and get one? Now, little naive Rafe, I, I didn't know what he was even talking about at this point, but I was always up for a good dare. And so uh, I volunteered to be the guy that was going to do this uh, undercover mission at night to sneak into the basement. Well, we were up on the second floor, had to get all the way past the basement. His parents were up in the kitchen. I, re I very clearly remember walking down these stairs in the middle of this night. And uh, he told me exactly where I'd find the stack. And sure enough, snuck downstairs, went down to the basement into his dad's kind of work room. And there in the corner of the closet was a stack of Playboy magazines, about waist high. And I grabbed two or three of them, still not sure what I was grabbing at the time, and ran upstairs as fast as I could, knowing that there was something mischievous about what I held in my hand. I got upstairs with the guys. We opened those magazines, and I remember as a 12-year-old boy realizing I'm seeing something I'm not supposed to be seeing right now. But there was something that I couldn't stop not looking at it. There was a 12-year-old boy with a few other 12-year-old boys. And what happened on that first time, I saw a pornographic image. It began a pattern, even at the age of 12 years old, whereby I was drawn from that point on towards seeking after pornographic imagery. Now, that was before the internet. I'm aging myself here a little bit, and I'm a young pastor. <laughs> that was before the internet. And once the internet came out and access to imagery and videos and all different types of pornography became available, that small habit became a larger habit in my life as a young man. Depending on what source you look at, the average age that an American kid sees their first pornographic image is between the ages of 8 and 11. I just want you to think about that for a moment. The average age a young child in this country sees their first pornographic age image can be at the age of 8. Now, to those of you who are dads right now, I just want you to know we got work to do to shepherd our children through what's coming up in their life. It's getting earlier and earlier and earlier on that our children are being exposed to difficult subjects and to difficult content. And when I was that age, as most of you who are watching this will attest, what you could discover at that age, if you could find something, was a stash of magazines that a friend's dad possibly had. But today, with the advent of phones and the advent of techno technology, literally there is more violent, more graphic, more disturbing content available to children at a younger age. And I'm convinced that pornography, if it is not the strongest, it is close to the strongest vice grip that Satan has over American men, over Western men, over Christian men in the church today. As men, there are a number of vices and addictions that we, in pattern, in a patterned way, oftentimes fall into. We fall into addictions of all different kinds of, kinds of things. I think there's something about the nature of men. Women fall into addictions all the time as well. But something about men pursuing particular tasks, the way our mind works, we're very prone to addictive behavior. And for some men, addiction will come out in all different types of ways. Some of you watching this, your issue you're dealing with is not pornography. But maybe you have an addiction towards video games. Maybe you have an addiction towards TV. Maybe you have an addiction towards work and you just can't turn it off. Addiction comes in all different types of ways. I'm going to look through the lens of pornography today because I think it's one of the strongest addictions we have. But some of what I'm going to share and some of what I want to share about how Christ can break those chains will apply to you in any number of different circumstances you're in or any number of different addictions you're in, whatever is personal to you. What is new today is that the, the world of pornography, the world of adultery, uh, can be accomplished in the privacy of your own home. According to the statistics, between 80% of men between the ages of eight, 18 and 30 will look at porn at least once a month. Uh, now, hear that again. Between up, upwards of 80% of men will look at porn at least one, once a month. And if you look at all ages, 
all ages, so not just 18 to 30, but all ages, that number is still close to 70% of men are looking at pornography on some kind of a regular basis. Now, here's my prayer for today. One, I want to expose the detriments of what pornography is doing to your mind and your relationship with God and your relationship with others. I want to expose, I think part of overcoming sin is that you begin to realize that the fullness of that sin, of the kind of havoc it's wreaking in your life and in the life of others. And then I want to move you towards solution. I want to show you the hope you have in Christ and how the gospel applies to this and the victory you can have. The victory you can have in Christ over addictions, particularly over the sin and the addiction of pornography. And I'm going to look at this through the lens of warfare. As you'll see as we go further through this, I believe this is spiritual warfare. I believe Satan is waging a full-on war, and pornography is a tool he's using to captivate men's minds and to draw them away from their marriages, to draw them away from godliness. So some of my outline for today is going to come in the format of looking at it through warfare. I'm going to start point one with the reality of war, the reality of war. To frame this conversation, I want to go back to a character in the Old Testament, a man we've looked at a number of times in this series, King David. Now, what do we remember about King David? King David was a man after God's own heart. This was a mighty warrior. If you don't know much about King David, just remember, he's the, in the Old Testament, he's the quintessential king. He's a Christ-like figure. Not that he is Christ or that he is a Messiah in any ways, but much of his life, of who he was and what he accomplished and what promises came through him, point us towards the fuller king, King Jesus, who would come many years after David through David's line. David was a very important king in the Old Testament. And of all the greatness that King David did, You think of all the things that David accomplished, all the work he did, all the promises that God made through him, the legacy he made in the people of God. The thing that oftentimes David is most remembered for, most remembered for, his entire career, and the thing, the the footnote that hangs over David's life is the adulterous relationship he had with Bathsheba and all the fallout that came because of one look he made at a woman who was undressing near him. We read the beginning of the account in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. It reads this way. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, that's the setting. It's the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle. David sent Joab, that's the commander of his military, and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful. And what we have here is a very tempting moment. David is not where he's supposed to be. Do you notice the setting? David, where is he supposed to be? It's the spring. He's the king. He's King David. He's the best warrior of all the men that David's got. He's supposed to be with his men on the battlefield, but he's not there. See, what happened in David's heart is he got a little cocky. He let his guard down. He thought, hey, you know what? Our kingdom's expanding. The wars we're fighting are not that difficult. I got good military men. Joab is in place. I've kind of set myself up for success. I can sit back, just be a little lazy on this whole thing, and let the military go out there, and I can take it easy. I'm the king, aren't I? I mean, the king can rest a little bit, can't he? But David stays home, lets his men go do the battle. He stays home. And he's one day walking on the roof of his palace, and he looks out over the roof. Now, in that day, there was the palace, and you can look at images if you wanted to, to look at what Jerusalem looked like in that day. Palace was kind of near the center. You had the temple, obviously. Well, not the temple, but you had the, where, the, where the king lived. And then you had uh, around there, around there, you had all the houses of the people who were close to King David. And so a man like Uriah the Hittite, who was one of David's mighty men, very close friend of David, possibly one of David's best friends. His house would have been very close to the palace where David was living, the place where David would live. And David looks out, and from the the king's place where he was living, he would have been able to see over the walls of the outer courts of the homes that were around the palace, over the homes where David was. He would have been able to look out and see into the backyards of his men. He should be out at a war. That's where Uriah was, but he's home, And he looks out and he sees Bathsheba. 
walking in the privacy of her home, which would have been acceptable to do. That would have been the appropriate place for Bathsheba to bathe. There were walls all around. The only person who could have possibly seen that was someone walking on the king's house. And the king wasn't where he was supposed to be. And he looks out and he sees Bathsheba bathing. David has a moment. He realizes as soon as he sees Bathsheba that he shouldn't be there. Now, men, you know that feeling. You see something that you know you shouldn't be looking at. You know you shouldn't see. You know it's not God-honoring because the Holy Spirit, if you're a Christian man, dwells inside of you. You know you should avert your eyes. You should look somewhere else. You should go do something else. But David doesn't do that. He takes a second look. And it's in that second look, it's after that moment passes where David has a choice to exercise self-control, one of the fruits of the Spirit, but he fails and then he takes a second look that all hell begins to break loose. 2 Samuel, verse 11, now verses 3 to 5. Chapter 11. And David sent and acquired about the woman. And one said, notice his first step, David sent, acquired about the woman. And... One said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David and said, I am pregnant. Now I want you to see here what happens in the escalation of sin. Notice the, the series of events that take place. It started with a glance, and David saw something he shouldn't have been seeing because he wasn't where he was supposed to be. And then that led to a not-so-innocent question. Who is that? He actually got someone else involved at that point. He called over another man. At this point, he's now observing this woman. He calls someone else. He says, who's that? And the other man, you almost can sense it in the way he responds to David. He's like, uh, <laughs> David, I mean... I don't, know, I don't know if you should be doing this, but that's Uriah. That's one of your closest friend's wives. Then it grows to a sinister invitation. Bring her up to me, which grows into an adulterous relationship, which eventually will arrive at the murder of his friend Uriah and the pregnancy of Bathsheba. This is how sin works. Sin escalates. Sin never just stays dormant in one level. This is how addiction works. Addiction begins with something that you think is not that bad, that won't grow to something more. This is the escalation of drugs. Those of you who either have gone through a season in your life where you've been addicted to drugs or you have good friends that you've seen this escalation of drugs work in their life, it starts with something small and then it grows to something more and then it grows to something more. Sin always demands more recklessness. And when you leave sin unchecked, when you leave it unchecked and you don't stop it in its tracks and you don't demand the power of the Lord Jesus Christ to break the power and the curse of sin in your life, it grows and it grows and it grows. The escalation of sin and addiction. I was listening to Vadi Bakum recently talk about pornography. He's a theologian and a dean of a seminary out in Zambia. And Vadi Bakum was talking about the culture that we live in in America right now. And he said, look, if, if you were to draw a line and, and just kind of this spectrum, he said, on the one side is absolutely no pornography. You're living in a culture and your eyes and your mind were completely pure. You had no access, nor were you thinking about anything that was impure. And then on, on this side, you have someone who is all out, fully addicted to porn. It's destroying their life, and they're just in a world of complete impurity, right? That's your spectrum, one to ten. He said, the average American male lives constantly, every day, at a three to four. Just because we live in a country that has been completely sexualized, from the billboards we see, to the magazines we see, to the advertisements we see, to the way that is common for women to dress every day in the culture that we live in, including within the churches we go to, there is almost no space where you can go as a modern American male where you're not going to be operating in about a three to four on the sexuality scale. Now, I want you to consider that for just a moment. Satan nearly took David down for one glance at a woman he shouldn't have been looking at. It escalated quickly. 
He didn't have his guards up. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. And he didn't depend on the power of the Spirit to exercise self-control. And he has taken many, many good men down with those same types of glances in our modern American culture. We're told in Ephesians chapter 6 about the demonic spiritual warfare that you and I live in all the time. We're told that Satan is a very real, powerful person and that he is seeking to bring you down, that that he is waging a warfare against you. We read in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 12, this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and, and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Notice, the schemes of the devil. He's scheming. What that means is that he knows you. He knows your wiring. He's behind things. He's trying to put you in circumstances and tempt you to get you to get your eyes off of Jesus and a pursuit of godliness. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, against the cosmic powers in this present darkness, and against spiritual forces in the heavenly places. When a man today is tempted, I want you to understand what's happening. When you are tempted to look at pornography, when you are tempted to think impure thoughts, what most of the time is happening is not just that your sinful nature is waging war against your new self in Christ, but it is being fueled by satanic attacks on your life. He wants to bring you down. Pornography is a tool Satan uses. And so whenever you are engaging in pornography, you are engaged in a spiritual battle. And when you succumb to the pressure, when you actually view and you engage with pornography, Satan is gaining a victory over you. I say that not to produce a sense of guilt or a sense of shame, a sense of reality of war and what we're dealing with. It's spiritual warfare. Now I want to look at the collateral damage. We looked at the reality of war. Next, let's look at the collateral damage. As with any war, there's always collateral damage. You can't go to war and someone that you don't expect to get hurt doesn't get hurt. That's what happens with every war. When we go back to David, we see that there's clearly collateral damage between David and Bathsheba. He gets her pregnant. And then what he does is he tries to cover it up. He tries to make a situation where no one's going to find out what happened because he needs to keep this a secret. He's committed this adulterous relationship that started with just a glance at a woman, and now he's got to try to cover his tracks. So David goes to another sinister level to try to do that. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 14 to 17, reads this way. Verse 14, in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab. Remember, that's the commander of his military. And he sent it by the hand of Uriah. He had called Uriah back to try to see if Uriah would sleep with his wife. But Uriah was too honorable a man. Uriah knew if his men were on the battlefield, he was not going to enjoy the pleasures of his home. And so Uriah said no to David's temptation. Notice how now David is tempting Uriah. So David sent a letter back in the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him that he might be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab. And some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite also died. What I'm trying to show you right now is that there's always collateral damage when it comes to warfare. For David... He ended up murdering one of his best friends, Uriah the Hittite. He ended up getting a woman pregnant who wasn't his wife. Here's the thing. The great news is that Jesus heals. At any point in the journey of the escalation of sin, you can invite Jesus in. And there's a process for it. Repentance, confession of sin, accountability, and the power of the Spirit. It works. Every time, it works. At any point, you can bring Jesus and allow him to fully expose the sin and break the chain that's taking place. But you've got to invite him in. That's the good news. He can do it. But when you leave it unchecked, you try to cover it up, what happens is more and more collateral damage. Now, I want to go through some of the other collateral damage that comes by us looking at porn, by men looking at porn. And when I do this, I'm not sharing this to try to produce a sense of shame. In fact, in just a little bit, I'm going to talk about shame and how shame is another tool Satan uses to keep us in patterns of sin to keep us particularly in the sin of pornography. This is not to produce shame, but it is to produce a sense of the reality. I can tell you that myself, learning of these things many years ago, 
This is part of what broke the pattern of sin of pornography in my own life, was learning the full effect that my viewing of pornography was having on the world around me. Here's a number of things. Number five, or five uh, pieces of collateral damage. Number one, when you watch pornography, you begin over time to see women as objects. Particularly, you begin to see them as sexual objects. I cannot tell you how devastating this is to the church and how real this is in the mind of a man. When you regularly are bringing in ideas into your mind that when you see women, you're seeing them naked and you're seeing them in sexual postures and in sexual ideas, when you are constantly bringing that into your mind, you are actually forming in your mind synapses. Something's happening in your mind where memories are being formed, synapses are being formed, and your brain is being wired. Your brain is very plasticky. It can be molded and it can be remolded. But when you're constantly bringing in images of naked women into your mind, what's taking place is a forming of your mind so that when you go out into other spaces, let's say your church, what happens is, is that those same rewirings are now in operation. And you begin looking out across a room and rather than seeing, as we talked about last week, women as sacred sisters whom your role is to lift them up and see them flourish and to serve them as, as image bearers of God, as people that you've been given strength to care and shepherd and lift up. Rather than that, you begin seeing them as objects. You begin fantasizing in your mind. Men who have been addicted to pornography or that are addicted to pornography, you know what I'm saying is true. We begin seeing women as objects, and I cannot tell you the devastation this brings on our sisters. They know it. They see it. They experience it, and it breaks relationships. Number two, pornography is strongly connected with depression. A number of journals have been written uh, over the last number of years connecting the use of pornography with depression. One a psychologist in writing in Psychology Today did her own experimentation with this, and she tried to connect uh, people that she was counseling and the addictions they had to pornography to their level of depression they were experiencing. She found that in general, those that were viewing pornography daily were scoring in the severely depressed range. So, so she had this range of like depressed to severely depressed. Those that were viewing pornography daily, so the most amount of pornogra pornographic users, they were in the severely depressed range. There is an actual clinical connection between pornography and depression. When you're bringing this in, and, and that makes sense, right, from a spiritual landscape. Satan loves depression. He loves to rob you of the joy you have in Christ. And he loves to keep you from thinking godly thoughts, uh, joy-filled thoughts, satisfied thoughts in Christ. And if he can use pornography as a tool to bring your mind to an impure place in order to sink depression into your heart, he has gained a double victory. Satan uses pornography to grow uh, depression. Number three, it destroys relationships. Number three, it destroys relationships. The Family Research Council uh, states this, they said pornography use is a pathway to infidelity and divorce, and it frequently is a major factor in these family disasters. Pornography use is a major factor both in infidelity and divorce. One website called Sold No More uh, claims that 56% of divorces that take place today involve one person having an obsessive interest in pornography. 56%. There's a direct connection between the end of marriages and pornography. They go on to say married men who are involved in pornography, uh, pornography feel less satisfied with their conjugal relations and less emotionally attached to their wives. Wives notice and are upset by the difference. This should not be a surprise. This is like a no-brainer. If you as a man are constantly and regularly intaking other women outside of your wife, or if you're single and you're constantly bringing in other women besides the woman who one day, maybe, perhaps if God's called you to be married, you will be married to, what's happening is you're developing emotional relationships with other women that are supposed to be reserved for only your wife. Not only do you see them as objects, but you actually gain some kind of an attachment to these people, seeing them through a certain lens. And it paves way for disaster in relationships. Divorce happens. This happens even within the church. We see this taking place regularly. 
We think pornography is just a private issue, but it grows to overtake other relationships. Pornography, number four, creates generational cycles of sin. What was my story? How did I get introduced to pornography? It was my friend's dad who kept a stash of pornography in his house. One psychologist uh, wrote a book called Re Reclaiming Surrendered Ground. Reclaiming Surrendered Ground, great book about spiritual warfare. And he says he tells a story about how oftentimes he'll have a mother bring her young son into the counseling room, and, and the mother will say, I, I caught my son with pornography. Now, I already feel uncomfortable for that young boy <laughs> and the, the experience of walking to a counseling office with his mom, but the mom's doing the right thing. She's trying to get him help right away, early, get, get rid of this problem in the house. And the counselor will look at the mom and say, can you, have, can you have the boy leave? And the boy will leave. And then the mom will say, does your husband have a problem with pornography? And oftentimes the wife will say, no, not that I know of. So the counselor will say, well, bring, bring your husband to me. So a week later, the husband will come and he'll sit down with the husband and say, your wife brought your son in because your son is beginning to have a problem with pornography. Tell me, you're the father. Do you have an issue with pornography? And nine out of 10 times, that father will say sheepishly, yes. And what the psychologist will explain, he says, you have to understand you are the head of your house. And when you as a dad are bringing pornography into your home, you're inviting demonic presence into your home, particularly spirits of lust, spirits of adultery, spirits of sex. And what they're doing is they're, they're waging war on you, but you have other people in your home. And so they're now waging war on others. And any sin a father practices will be practiced in double by their child. He said, did you know you were impacting your child in that way? And he says, the first way, the psychologist says, the first way to save the child is to first save the father. If he can break that curse, if he can break that pornographic habit in the father's life, he knows that father will be the most powerful tool in breaking the curse in the young boy's life. What does this mean? I believe that pornography is an access point for demonic control and demonic presence in your life. And what I'm asking of you is to recognize it at this point, to see that there are others that are involved. Number five, connection between sex trafficking and porn. This is the last point. I want to say this very clearly, and this is devastating to read the research on this. I actually invite you, if you are addicted to porn right now, if you're trying to find a way through this, reading on this topic might be a game changer for you. The global sex trade is at least a $3 billion industry, $3 billion industry at least. It's actually far more than that. The problem with the sex industry is so much of it is kind of in the, the underground market and it's hard to measure. Just the stuff we know of is a $3 billion market. As a, I lived in Thailand as a missionary for a number of years, for a year after college, and Thailand is the center of the sex trade in the world. That's where most of it kind of funnels through. And I've seen with my own eyes the devastation that this sex trade has on culture. In 2018, the White House reported that per the International Labor Organization, 4.8 million victims were forced into sexual exploitation. When you view porn, you are providing the demand that will be met by the supply. When you engage in pornography, and much of the pornography on the internet is actually women that have been coerced into the sex trade, even when you don't realize that's what you're looking at, you are providing the demand that others will meet with supply. Five ways of collateral damage. Now, all of that is true. Those are the very real consequences of our use of pornography, and yet we still often choose to pursue it. And the reason for that is because it's an addiction. There's chemical things that are happening inside your body when you're viewing pornography, and it functions much like a drug in your life. Also, there is a deeper issue at the center, and that issue is our worship of God. And this is where we must begin to talk about the solution. This is where I want to come back to. Remember, our strength as men, our leadership as men, has been given to us as a gift from God designed to be used to further God's kingdom and to lift others up. God wants to see you be someone that brings everyone else up around you, your wife, your children, your church, your coworkers, your neighbors. That's a life lived for God. That's the godly life that you were made for. And when a man looks at porn, you are literally participating in the exact opposite. Whenever someone enjoys sex outside of marriage or what they're doing is they're using their strength 
in a misdirected way. We talked about this. The misdirected man uses all those things God's given them that are supposed to be applied towards the kingdom and he uses it in a self-centered way. Not only have we seen the destruction that it brings to others, but it's being done out of a sense of self-centeredness. It's a desire to satisfy oneself. To give up pornography, I want you to understand this, to give up pornography and to turn from ungodliness and to turn towards Christ is not just giving something up. What's also happening is that you're opening yourself up to a far greater and better pleasure to be filled by God instead of seeking to satisfy yourself through sin. There is a deeper, truer life out there. You are made for more than the meaningless pleasures that come from looking at pornography. We were made to give our lives away in service to others and in, in pursuit of the glory of God, and pornography robs you of that. Remember, 2 Timothy chapter 3 reads, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, uh, heartless, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal and not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. Misdirected men and restrained men fall into these traps. And it's all in contrast to what God has designed you for. He gave us strength. But look, love is ultimately not about me. And when you're viewing pornography, you're taking a God-centeredness and you're making it a me-centeredness and you're making your world very small. All sex outside of a marriage is a self-love. It's all a self-love. It's, it's liberating, even life-giving for a man to use his strength to love and bless others. It feels good as a man. You are made for that. That's why it feels good, because you were literally woven. The fabric of your heart was made to pour yourself out to others. And it feels depressing, and it feels meaningless when you're doing the opposite of that. I want you to understand, you're not just giving something up when you turn from pornography. You're gaining something far greater. You're gaining the fullness of what you were made for. Now, next, I want to look at the peace treaty. How do we move forward? The peace treaty. What happens in David's life is he's finally confronted. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, the prophet Nathan comes up to David and confronts him. He says, David, behold, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 11 through, just at verse 11, reads, Thus the Lord says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them into your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this sin. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all of Israel and before the sun. Sun, S-U-N. This prophet comes up to David and confronts David on his sin. He says, God saw everything. And he says, David, here's the consequence of what's going to happen. God saw it. And at the end of this long list of all the stuff that's going to happen, David looks to David and says, Nathan looks to David and says, all of this is going to happen to you and your sin is going to be exposed in public. And to the whole long list of everything Nathan said was going to come on David, David ne never says anything. He never says anything until Nathan says it's going to be exposed to public. And then David jumps in and David says, I have sinned against the Lord. See this confession? I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan says to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. David cries out after he realizes his shame. He cries out when he realizes that what he's done in private can't be covered up anymore and it's going to be made public. Shame is very powerful in a very negative way. It cripples people. All this time, he was keeping it secret. All this time, he was trying to cover up his sin. And he was just fighting with the shame, with the shame, with the shame, with the shame. And then Nathan finally peels it open and says, not anymore. God, God's not going to let you just stay in that place. God's going to expose this. And finally, when the shame gets released, he falls on his knees. And the first thing he does is he runs to God. And Nathan responds back, says, you will be forgiven for your sin. At the heart of the conversation with pornography, ultimately, it's the gospel. We need to talk about the gospel. But also with men, there's so much shame in this conversation. Shame is when we hide. We don't confess. When we pretend like we got it all together on the outside and we're not dealing with an addiction on the inside. 
Kurt Thompson, who wrote a book on shame called The Soul of Shame, he says, whether it's the involution into the silence of our own minds or the literal turning away from someone with a downcast facial expression with eyes lowered, shame leads us to cloak ourselves with invisibility to prevent further intensification of the emotion. Men, when you deal with pornography, when you try to just deal with it on your own and you don't let anybody else in, you don't share it. You don't confess it. Sometimes you don't even confess it to God, to be honest with you. But God knows. I and mean, it's just like David. God knew everything. But when you allow shame to hinder you from authentic relationships with other men who can hold you accountable, who can help you walk through this, you are literally putting this barrier to seeing healing come through. And the way God wants to bring healing is to expose that barrier, to allow shame to be released, all that pressure to be released of shame, and then to allow the gospel to come in and work its way into your life. Kurt Thompson goes on, he says, shame's healing encompasses the counterintuitive act of turning toward what we are most terrified of. We fear the shame that we will feel when we speak of that very shame. In some circumstances, we anticipate this vulnerable exposure to be so great that it will be almost life-threatening. But it is in the movement towards another, towards connection with someone who is safe, that we come to know life and freedom from this prison. Let me go first. Let me share my story with you. That 12-year-old boy that I first shared with grew up, and I would say, looking back, while I didn't have this language back then, through my college years with the work and the help of uh, the internet, I I think looking back on my life, there was an addiction to pornography. It wasn't an everyday thing, but it was regular enough that I would say, looking back, there was an addiction to pornography that was taking place within my heart and within my mind. The way God broke that in my life, about 12 years ago, the way God broke that in my life, is he had me in a group of men, a small group of men. And we, as a group of men, suddenly got serious about the reality that every man in that group had an addiction, had a certain level of usage to pornography. And and all of a sudden we had this realization, why is that? Why is every man here looking at pornography when all of us are godly men seeking after the things of God? And so what I did is I, for the, for the group, I said, you know what, guys, I want to do a Bible study on repentance. I want to understand what repentance means. I don't know if I've ever really studied that before. So I took the lead and I went back and I started doing a Bible study on repentance. And I came back to the men and I reported what I found, that repentance is turning from sin and confessing our sin and, 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 then, and then turning from it and running to God and allowing the power of the gospel to work its way in in community. And I I shared what I found on, on the work of repentance in the Bible with the men. And as I was sharing, I can tell you this, I remember the experience I had. As I was sharing, I remember the power of the Spirit working on me in such a way that I knew I was done for the rest of my life ever looking at pornography. There was a repentance a confession, a welcoming of other men into the journey with me, knowing that I wasn't in it alone, and the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus, who died on the cross, not just to forgive you of your sin, but to fill you with the Spirit so that you could overcome sin. You won't be perfect in this life, but you will overcome sin. And Jesus brings full victory, hear that, full victory from that day, from that day, To today, I can tell you, not only have I never looked at a pornographic image, today, what God has done in my life, in my heart, the thought of a pornographic image disturbs me. It disturbs me. It makes me angry and sick to my stomach. Recently, I was was, uh, attacked on Facebook, and someone sent a pornographic image to my Facebook account. And I, not knowing that I was clicking on the image, I clicked on it, and it appeared before my my Facebook. And there was a, a nauseous feeling that went up inside of my stomach that I was seeing something that I hadn't seen in so many years, and I didn't want to. God brings victory. No one tells you that anymore. No one says that God doesn't just want you to live in a partial victorious place. Jesus brings full victory. And here's how it happens. Through repentance, turning from sin, confession to God and to other trusted men who are going to be in the battle with you, and accountability. What happened after that day is we entered into a group of accountable men where we said we're in this together. We're not going to let each other stumble. And if anyone stumbles, it's not shame. It's not guilt. It's being in the battle with them. And it's prayer saturated march towards victory. Men, 
That's what God wants for you. He wants you to overcome the sinful habits in your life that are hurting yourself, poising you for devastation in your life and the life of others, and hurting and hindering the growth of the church. He can do that in your life. Men, turn to Christ. The battle we wage against pornography in our culture and in our church is wreaking havoc. It is not a private sin. It is crippling our men and therefore crippling our church. You are in a group of men right now. And I don't know how much you've learned to trust these men. This takes trust with men. But I want to challenge you to have a season of confession, to look to men in your church, perhaps the very men in your group, and to share what's going on. If your issue is not pornography, share what is going on. Be authentic and vulnerable with each other and let the Spirit move. Men, turn to the men around you. Have meaningful conversations. And I'll see you again next week.